Hey everybody, welcome to Money's No Object. I'm your host, Dylan Howell. This is episode number 114 of our YouTube channel and podcast, and I cannot be more excited to continue sharing with you guys personal finance topics that I think could be useful to you in your long-term financial journey. Today, we are going to continue in the same vein as we have for the rest of this week. We have been talking about books that I think you should read in 2021 and books that I think can be helpful to you in 2021 in extending your personal finance knowledge and creating a more successful long-term financial journey for yourself. We've talked about a few books so far. We've talked about The Total Money Makeover by Dave Ramsey, uh, which is a very strict personal finance book that gives you a plan to work that uh, is very similar to my financial action plan uh, and is what I used as a basic template as to how I want to set up the financial action plan. And then we talked about The Intelligent Investor by Ben Graham. And uh, that, of course, is one of the landmark works on investing that has ever been done. And then we talked about The Little Book of Common Sense Investing by John Bogle uh, and how that has some timeless principles of low cost investing and fund investing. Well, today we are going to talk about another investing book, and that is Stocks for the Long Run by Jeremy Siegel. And I think you can gain a lot uh, from this summarization uh, of this book and understanding what's in this book and, and picking this book up sometime during 2021 and giving it a read through uh, this year sometime. So uh, that is what we're going to cover today. And I believe uh, that you can benefit a lot from uh, another one of these great finance books uh, that I'm recommending to you for this year. Before we get started, though, if you could go down below, hit the big red subscribe button, like this video, leave any feedback in the comments down below as we go throughout this episode, and I will be sure uh, to get back to you anything that you put down there, questions, comments, I will be sure to respond. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify podcasts, then be sure to subscribe and leave me a review on either one of those sites. Follow me on social media at MNO with Dylan, and I'm on all the major social media sites, so just be sure to follow me there. And then if you need somebody to help you to create a financial plan that will work for you and your family, you need somebody to help you to create a plan uh, that will be effective and keep you accountable to that plan, I can help you do that. Just go to my website, www.mnowithdylan.com. Click on the Work with Dylan tab and you can choose the financial coaching session type that will work best for you and we can begin pushing towards your long-term financial goals together. Now, stocks for the long run. Now, obviously just by the title, you can kind of get a good feel as to what this book is about. It's about investing in the stock market for the long term, being a long-term investor in the stock market, being a bull in the stock market as they would call them. But this book was written in 1994 by Jeremy Siegel. And uh, Jeremy Siegel is a professor at the Wharton School of Business at uh, the University of Pennsylvania. So an Ivy League uh, professor in the College of Business. So very knowledgeable individual, a finance PhD guy. So he has a lot of empirical knowledge of the stock market. Uh, but within this book, he makes things a lot more practical and a lot simpler uh, for those of us out there who want to know more about the stock market, who want to know uh, why they should invest in the stock market over the long term, uh, and what the actual evidence is that that is an effective strategy. And as I said, Stocks for the Long Run was written in 1994, and it has been revised as recently as 2014. So there are some very recent numbers uh, in this book that would really give you the reason to believe that investing in stocks over the long term is a great idea. Now, what this book does is it takes a long-term view of the stock market starting as early as 1802. So as far as getting a comprehensive view of the stock market and a long-term view of the stock market, there are few better books. This, uh, as far as the data that was used and the amount of data that was used to come to the conclusions of uh, Jeremy Siegel is fantastic and you cannot beat it with a stick in any other book that you may read. This book is so influential and there's so much good empirical uh, evidence within it that, uh, you know, as a PhD student, I'm a uh, finance PhD candidate uh, and in my investment seminar, one of the suggested readings was uh, Stocks for the Long Run. And I had read this book previously before uh, that particular seminar, but uh, this was an extremely useful book in understanding the stock market over the long term. And you can get a lot of good empirical understanding of what the stock market is 
just by reading this book. And it is not written in a way that is extremely difficult to understand. You would think with it being more empirical and being more based on historical data uh, that it would not be as interesting. But I find that Stocks for the Long Run is just as easy to read, if not more easy to read, than some of the books that we talked about earlier this week. It, I would say that on a scale of easiest to most difficult, uh, this is not the easiest to read. The easiest of the ones to read this week is probably the Total Money Makeover, uh, but the most difficult was probably uh, The Intelligent Investor. And then the little book of Common Sense Investing uh, and this one, Stocks for the Long Run, fall somewhere in the middle together. So don't think just because I'm talking about it including empirical data that it is such a difficult book to read and understand. It is absolutely not. But a lot of the things that he pulls from that empirical data, he explains in a way that is understandable to the common individual. Now, many have dubbed this book the buy and hold Bible. Now we've talked about buy and hold investing before and buy and hold investing is nothing more than purchasing something for the long term and just holding it, not buying and selling at any given time, but buying something and just holding on to it for the long term. And so Siegel is making the argument for buying uh, the stock market, buying specific stocks and holding them for the long term. And he argues that the stock market over the past 200 years, so uh, from that 1802 year uh, to the uh, most recent data point that he has, so uh, it was most recently revised in 2014, so his data probably ends a little bit before that. Uh, he says that the stock market has averaged 6.5 to 7% a year after inflation. So we're talking about real returns. And for those of you who don't know what I mean when I say real returns, obviously all returns that you get are real, but anytime that you receive some type of return, uh, inflation, whatever the inflation rate is, is eating away at that return systematically. So what that means is that this 65 to 7% is not the gross annual average return of the stock market uh, over that 200 year period. Uh, it is the after you take inflation into account, the real return. And so obviously the gross return would be greater than that. We know that. We know that the gross return is closer to a 10% number. And Siegel makes an argument in this book that based on uh, what the equity risk premium has been, so this equity risk premium is nothing more uh, than the return on the stock market, less uh, the return of the treasury bond, typically the uh, risk-free treasury bond, meaning the shortest maturity treasury bill. So if you take that difference, that would be the equity risk premium. Uh, and he makes an argument that the equity risk premium has been quite high and that you should expect that over the next few decades that you see lower uh, returns, lower equity uh, risk premiums, but still enough to say uh, that over the long term, you should be invested in the stock market and you should be buying and holding over the long term. So within this book, there are a few different ideas that he does cover, uh, and I want to talk about each in uh, a pretty succinct way here, but I want to talk about each of them uh, just so you understand what you can find within this book. The first is the verdict of history. So he's looking at stock and bond returns since 1802, as I've been talking about. Uh, he's looking at risk, return, and the coming age wave and perspectives on stocks as investments. And obviously what this is going to do for you as a reader is give you a better idea of history. And as I've told you over and over and over is that history can help us to understand the future. Understanding what has happened in the past in the stock market can help us to understand what is going to happen in the future of the stock market. I've talked about stock market crashes and how if you will examine stock market crashes, you will have a better idea of what to do when the next stock market crash is to come. And that's not to say that everything is going to look the same. That is not to say that everything does look the same or that you can do the exact same thing and it will work the exact same way. That is not what I'm arguing at all. What I am arguing is that things rhyme. And what I mean by things rhyme is that events, even though they may not be exactly the same, they can be extremely, extremely similar. And uh, if you can use the past as some gauge for the future, you can understand what is likely to occur in the stock market 
over the long term, over the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 years uh, that you may be invested. If you're invested for 100 years, then uh, I need to get on whatever diet plan that you're on uh, because obviously you're eating the things that'll, that'll keep you alive. But um, you know, investing for the long term, and when I say 100 years, it could be uh, for your children, it could be for your heirs, it can be investing for um, you know, a foundation into the future if you, know, you have the money to do that type of thing as well. And so um, understanding how stocks work over the long term can inform your use of the stock market and can inform how you choose to invest and the long-term viewpoint that you use in order to invest. Now then, of course, within this book, uh, Siegel also just talks about stock returns. So he talks about uh, the returns of the averages, the dividends of the averages, because obviously that makes up a substantial portion of returns. He talks about earnings because uh, as said in Bogle's book, The Little Book of Common Sense Investing, uh, obviously what you're receiving as return is dividends and the earnings of the company. That is what is going to inform your returns. And he also talks about investor sentiment, large stocks versus small stocks, value stocks versus growth stocks, because obviously we've talked before uh, about diversification. We've talked about uh, these different types of companies that you can purchase. Uh, he talks about the Nifty 50, uh, which is an older concept, but the Nifty 50 being a group of 50 companies uh, that was um, a real big thing, you know, 60, 70 years ago. Uh, a real big idea, the Nifty 50. Then he talks about taxes and stock returns, and as well as international or global investing. And so he's talking a lot there about uh, the diversification of stocks and the different types of stocks that you can purchase and what you should expect from purchasing different types of stocks over time. Then he also goes into the economic environment of investing. So he talks about money and the way money cycles through the economy. He talks about gold and central banks like the Fed. We know uh, about the Fed and I'll be having episodes about the Fed here in the future. Uh, he talks about inflation and stocks. Obviously, uh, I played a little bit into that earlier when I was talking about real returns. That is obviously due to inflation. He talks about stocks and the business cycle, world events which impact financial stock markets. So obviously, something like the coronavirus pandemic, which has uh, a direct impact on the stock market or did have a direct impact on the stock market in a very, very real way. Uh, or things like uh, the global financial crisis or, uh, you know, 9-11, a world event that has a direct impact on the stock market. And um, then those, how those events impact stocks, bonds, and the flow of economic data. And so he goes through all of this um, within this book as well. And then he also talks about short-run fluctuations of stocks. And obviously, if you're going to write a book entitled Stocks for the Long Run, you need to talk about short-term fluctuations and why we don't need to be worried about short-term fluctuations in the stock market. And so within this short-term mindset that he, he's going to talk about, he talks about uh, index futures, he talks about uh, options and spiders, he talks about the market volatility and uh, the stock crash of October uh, 1987, that's Black Monday, we've talked a bit about that previously. He talks about technical analysis, investing with the trend, uh, so investing along with uh, the herd along with the group. And he talks about calendar anomalies as well. And so these are some things like, um, you know, the, the January effect where people, you know, tax loss sell, which we've talked about uh, previously, really recently, we've talked about ta tax loss selling uh, and how in January, a lot of people will pick up uh, positions again. And so January will typically have really good returns. So that's a particular calendar anomaly. So he talks about some of those as well. And then he kind of wraps everything up talking about building wealth through stocks. And so uh, he talks about funds, managers, beating the market and structuring a portfolio for long-term growth. All of these things uh, as an investor are extremely useful. All of these topics are extremely interesting uh, and can inform the way that we invest. It can inform the way that we choose to be an investor into the future. And um, I'm not saying you have to take any of this as law. Obviously, I've told you throughout the week that uh, there are certain things that some of these authors say that I may take with a grain of salt. But obviously, um, a lot of these individuals are really, really intelligent individuals who uh, have a lot of market experience. They understand stock markets very, very well and can help you to build long-term wealth. So within the 2002 edition of the book, and I think this would be uh, a really interesting thing to talk about with you guys, he kind of breaks down uh, different periods in market history 
uh, and talks about what the returns have been during those periods. And so for instance, he takes real returns, so again, adjusted for inflation, and he looks from 1871 to 2001. Okay, so that is a 130 year period. That's, that is a long time uh, to be looking at the market. Uh, and he finds that there's a 6.8% real return on stocks and only a 2.8% real return on bonds. And then he breaks some of that time period down into smaller increments. So he looks at 1946 to 1965, stocks earned a real 10% per year. So after inflation, 10% per year. So that gross return was actually greater than that. And then 1966 to 1981, stocks were negative 0.4% annually after inflation. Obviously, uh, that is a time when inflation was running rampant. Uh, the annual inflation rate at that time was 7% per year. And so you can see why the real return on stocks might be so low. And then from 1982 to 2001, stocks were earning 10.5% real returns uh, per year. So after inflation returns per year. And so you can see how over time, uh, inflation can eat into stock returns. You can see how much stock returns can differ over time and how much building wealth uh, can change the outlook for your long-term future. Because obviously, the higher inflation is, the more things you're going to cost. Therefore, the more return you need to earn in order to just keep up with inflation and be able to uh, truly grow your money in real terms over the long term. And Siegel even gives up that why the long-term return on stocks has been relatively constant is a mystery. And this is really, really interesting uh, because you would think that there would be a good explanation as to why returns have been as constant as they have. Obviously, it has something to do with the behavior of investors. And then obviously, it has something to do uh, with the fundamentals of companies. But then the question is, which approach is the correct approach? Is an empirical approach correct or is a behavioral approach correct? But regardless, uh, he lays out that the long-term returns have been pretty consistent, which is great for us to know as long-term investors because uh, it would be one thing if you know the last 100 years of returns had said something, but the previous 100 years had said something else, and it was so difficult to determine what the long-term returns were going to be moving forward. Uh, but we still have a good idea of what long-term returns will end up being. I mean, obviously, we don't know it to a T based on just those numbers that I gave you a moment ago. But what we do know is that if corporate earnings continue to grow uh, at some rate, and then corporations continue to pay out uh, either, either in the way of dividends or share repurchases, then there will be uh, increases in the stock market. And if inflation remains at a certain level, uh, then you can also have better predictions of what those real returns will be over time. And so even though we don't know, we can still kind of know. And that's the whole argument of Siegel's book is that we kind of know. We know that over the long term, uh, stocks are a good vehicle to own uh, in our portfolios. And a couple of interesting stats that Siegel lays out in this book, uh, he said that during 1802 to 2001, the worst one-year returns for stocks and bonds uh, were 38.6% negative for stocks and 21.9% negative for bonds. However, for a holding period of 10 years, and so this is that whole argument, right? Why you should hold things for the long term. For a holding period of 10 years, the worst performance for stocks and bonds were negative 4.1% for stocks and negative 5.4% for bonds. And for a holding period of 20 years, stocks have always been profitable. So if you are in your 20s, 30s, 40s, even 50s, and you are going to continue investing for the long term, why would you not purchase stocks? If you know that stocks have always been profitable over 20 years, if you know that stocks have been all but always profitable over 10 year periods, then why would you not own them? Why would you not own stocks for the long term? And that is Siegel's argument. Now, Siegel is a huge bull. He just came out uh, a day or two ago and was talking about that there is a way for you know the Dow to get to 35,000 this year. And, and as we've seen, I mean, the Dow's currently you know over 30,000. And at being over 30,000, um, to get to 35,000, we're talking a pretty substantial increase. We're talking about 16 to 17% in the stock market that must be 
uh, earned this year, and that is a very bullish outlook given uh, the bull years that we have had behind us. Uh, but that is who he is. But he does understand the market. He does understand that over the long term, stocks have appreciated and people can become exceedingly wealthy because of the compounding that occurs in the stock market. And this is the same thing that I want to convey to you guys. That's what I want to convey to you in our investing. I want to uh, make sure that you understand that when you invest, you don't need to invest with a bunch of uncertainty. You need to invest with the information that you can learn from these types of books that will tell you that over the long term, there's nothing to be afraid of. There's nothing to be afraid of in the stock market. History bears it out. And the market hasn't changed so profoundly that history won't continue to bear it out. Uh, so I'm not saying follow things blindly, but do the research yourself, read the books yourself, understand what these authors are saying, specifically what Siegel is saying, because I think this is one of the best arguments out there as to why long-term holding of stocks is a good idea. Why buy and hold investing is a good idea. If you ever want to understand why I am the type of investor I am, I am informed by books like this. I am informed by books like Bogle saying, you know, have low cost investing, own passive funds, own index funds, things like that. I understand that. And so I do those types of things. Uh, I also understand Siegel when Siegel's saying hold things for the long term. Don't buy and sell. Buy things and hold them and hold them and hold them and hold them. Uh, and that is the key to success. And I think Bogle would corroborate that. I think Ben Graham in a lot of ways would corroborate that. I think Ben Graham uh, in being the teacher of Warren Buffett and Warren Buffett being the ultimate compounder, the ultimate long-term investor uh, would also corroborate the statement that uh, if you're going to hold something, you would like to hold it for a long, long, long time uh, and you will make the best returns in doing so. And then obviously Dave Ramsey being a more uh, new age individual, being somebody who speaks a lot more on personal finances also agrees that you build wealth over the long term. So we can't have short term mindsets. And this book tells you why that is because short term mindsets can lead to large losses like you saw uh, from that 1802 to 2001, the worst one year period for stocks was negative 38.6%. Well, if you just sold out at that point and said, I'm never investing in stocks again, then you wouldn't have gotten the exceedingly great returns that stocks have offered over the long term uh, within those 10 year rolling stock returns and those 20 year rolling stock returns. Uh, so just be patient, invest for the long term. That is the whole point that Siegel has here. Now, there are some basic criticisms of this book, and so I just want to go through a couple of them. Uh, none of them make me not believe what Siegel's saying. I definitely believe what Jeremy Siegel is saying, but uh, it is good to know that there are a couple of detractors uh, because typically that means you've written something good. So some critics argue that the book uses a perspective that is too long to be applicable to today's long-term investors who in many cases are not investing for a 20 to 30 year period. Now, uh, that is a decent argument, but in order to not be investing for a 20 to 30 year period, uh, then you're probably uh, up there in age. Uh, I mean, even as a 50 year old, um, most individuals are living into their late seventies or eighties at this point anyway. And so if you're still in your fifties, uh, you still have, you know, 20 to 30 years that you are going to live. And if that is the case, then, you know, having a stock allocation that is going to be held over the long term is a useful thing to have. So, um, this is a decent argument if you are uh, really up there in age, but most people do have 20 or 30 years to invest, whether they think about it, whether they understand it or not, because retirement is not an end date for investing. It is an end date for contributions. It is not an end date for having to earn returns. It is an end date for contributions and beginning to take distributions from your account. So uh, that would be my rebuttal to that argument. Furthermore, uh, critics argue that picking different start and end dates or using different starting valuations uh, can yield significantly different results. So over long term periods, assets such as bonds, commodities, real estate, foreign equities or gold significantly outperform U.S. stocks, usually when starting valuation for stocks is significantly higher than the norm. And it's been shown several times uh, that stocks are uh, the best and one of the um, best performing assets out there. Now, I have talked about real estate and how the price appreciation of real estate has not necessarily kept up with stocks, uh, but stocks have blown bonds away over the long term, commodities, most commodities over the long term, most foreign equities over the long term. So um, U.S. stocks have won uh, and at, from the looks of things continue to win over the long term. 
And now one criticism of the book comes from an individual who I think is a, a very sharp guy, understands uh, financial markets very well. Obviously, he is a, uh, a Nobel Prize winning economist, and that is Yale economist Robert Schiller. He wrote A Rational Exuberance, which is another great book, but not one I'm going to talk about this week. And he warns that even a 20 or 30 year holding period is not necessarily risk free. And I don't think uh, Siegel argues that at all, but he is arguing holding for the long term. So I understand. He says that purchasing stocks at high valuation based on a P.E. ratio or his cyclically adjusted P.E. ratio uh, can yield poor returns over the long term, as well as significant drawdowns in the interim. Schiller also notes that the 20th century, on which many of Siegel's conclusions are based, was the most successful century for stocks in the short history of the United States. It will not necessarily repeat itself. So uh, I do agree with much of what uh, Schiller is saying there. And, you know, 20 or 30 year returns will be eaten into, obviously, if valuations are exceedingly high. Um, and so right now we even look and if you looked at uh, the P.E. ratio of the market right now, it is quite high. So you may think that for the next uh, however long in the market, uh, we may be beaten down a bit uh, as far as returns. But uh, that is not a suggestion. That is not um, a decision that I have made. That is not something that um, bears how I am going to invest. I still believe we can have good long-term returns. So does Siegel. That's why he is a full professor at such a prestigious school. That's why he is writing books like this. And that's why this book is such a timeless piece of investing information that every investor needs to read, especially those uh, who don't have a full understanding of the stock market and don't have a full trust that the stock market will create returns for them over the long term. Thanks for watching this video, guys. If you could go down below, hit the big red subscribe button, like this video, leave me any feedback in the comments down below if you haven't done so already. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify podcasts, then make sure to subscribe there and leave me a review on either one of those platforms. Follow me on social media at MNO with Dylan. And that is really good supplemental material to the things that I am going over every single day in these long form episodes. And then if you need somebody to help you create a financial plan that is specifically tailored to you and to help you stay accountable to and walk through that plan, I can help you do that. Just go to my website, www.mnowithdylan.com. Click on the Work With Dylan tab and you can choose the financial coaching session type that would work best for you and we can begin pushing towards your long-term financial goals together. So tune in tomorrow as I talk about the last book uh, that I think you should definitely read in 2021 uh, to inform your personal finances and to inform your investing. And that book is The Most Important Thing. It is literally called The Most Important Thing. Uh, by Howard Mark. So you should read that book uh, and we're going to talk about why in tomorrow's episode. So thanks for tuning in to today's episode of Money's No Object. I'm your host, Dylan Howe. God bless.